We'll just wait a minute again. Um, participants are adding up. <clears throat> okay. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Councilors of Real Estate and the International Council of Shopping Centers, it is a distinct privilege to welcome you to this session, What Next for Real Estate and the Life Experience, Reimagining Retail. Thank you for joining us. I'm Michel Cuillard, 2021 Global Chair of the Councilors of Real Estate and President and CEO of Buzak Real Estate Equities in Montreal, Canada. The Councilors of Real Estate is a distinguished international group of accomplished leaders within the real estate landscape, solving the world's most complex real estate challenges. Experienced, innovative, and credentialed problem solvers, counselors practice in 20 countries and offer expertise in more than 50 real estate disciplines across all asset types and classes. Each has earned the prestigious CRE designation. This webinar represents the very essence of the compelling thought leadership for which the counselors of real estate is known. We'd like to offer you a complimentary subscription to our peer-reviewed professional journal, Real Estate Issues, by visiting cre.org slash publications. And to learn more about the Counselors of Real Estate and its 1,000 CRE credential professionals, please visit cre.org. ICSC, as it is commonly known, is a the preeminent membership organization serving more than 70,000 retail, real estate, and allied professionals in 100 countries. Its core focus is building communities, fueling economies, and inspiring innovation. Today, we're honored and delighted to hear from two of its top leaders, Tom McGee and John Morrison, who will be introduced momentarily along with the rest of our superb panel. For additional information on ICSC, visit icsc.com. I'd like to recognize also our sponsors of this What's Next webinar series, the Altus Group, Equus Capital Partners, and Real Capital Analytics. Thank you, as always, for your support. While attendees will be muted during the course of today's event, you're encouraged to utilize the Q&A feature should you want to submit a question. Your participation is welcome and we'll answer as many questions as time allows. I'm pleased and privileged to introduce our moderator, James Nelson, CRE Principal and Head of Tri-State Investment Sales of Avis & Young in New York City. James leads the team of three dozen professionals in the sale of multifamily, office, and retail properties. Among the group's noteworthy clients are the Archdiocese of New York, Brookfield Properties, the Carlisle Group, J.P. Morgan Chase, Salvation Army, S.L. Green. Among several industries and philanthropic roles, James is a former chairman of the Real Estate Board of New York's Commercial Board of Directors and earns the board's, the board's prestigious award, the Edward S. Gordon Memorial Award. He sits on the Board of Governors for the Young Men's Women's Real Estate Association of New York. James is also an active member of ICSC. Welcome, James. Thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, and thank you for everything that you do for Counselors of Real Estate. Uh, we're so excited to be bringing you all this presentation today jointly with ICSC. It's fantastic that we have uh, of our panelists, multiple members who are, are, are dual members. Uh, and my, my only regret is that we, we, you know, we can't be doing this in person. And I just, I can't wait uh, until we uh, we get back to our in-person conventions and seeing you all in Vegas or in New York. And, uh, you know, I, I know we're all hopeful that that's right around the, the corner. Um, also, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. I did wear the green tie for today. Um, if we were in person, maybe we would be serving corned beef hash, but uh, we, we, will, uh, we will proceed. So in, in, in uh, no particular order, or, or, or I'll uh, introduce actually our, 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 uh, our leaders from ICSC first and then get to the rest of the panel. Uh, Tom McGee, who is president and CEO of ICSC. Uh, prior to joining ICSC, 
Tom served as vice chairman of Deloitte, one of the largest professional service firms in the United States. During his 26 years with Deloitte, he's held major global and US leadership roles. He's a noted business speaker with frequent appearances on CNBC, Bloomberg, and Fox Business, and he's here with us today. He has coined the term retail renaissance, so we're gonna definitely get into that today and what that means. He's also a guest writer for Forbes. Next, we have with us John Morrison, who's the 2021 chairman for ICSC. He's the former president and CEO of Choice Properties REIT based out of Toronto. He has over 40 years of experience with a primary focus on retail real estate. Uh, John was president and CEO of Primaris Real Estate Investment Trust from 2009 to 13. And prior to that, he was the president of Oxford Properties Group. He's a director of the ICSC Foundation, as well as a vice chair for ULI. Next, we have Deborah Jackson joining us, uh, also a counselors and ICSC member. She is the senior managing director with Cushman and Wakefield, directing its valuation consulting business since 2013. She has been in the real estate business, focusing on retail for over three decades, starting her career at Landauer, uh, which ended up merging uh, via Grubb and Ellis with Wiser LLP. She has an extensive background in providing consulting services for retail and other commercial assets, which includes due diligence for acquisitions, sales, litigation support, portfolio analysis, and valuation of real property. She's got a really impressive resume and projects that she has worked on, including uh, the Union Station uh, in DC, the Mall at World Trade Center, and has done work for Westfield. Uh, next we have with us my friend Jay Norris, who is co-founder of and CEO of Guest, a tech platform that powers the new retail. And we're gonna talk to Jay today about you know, what that new retail is. And he is an innovative leader who uses his creativity and imagination to uncover opportunities in today's challenge retail and real estate industries. Jay has a talent for building relationships and making strategic connections. He's a serial entrepreneur who began his career in the music business for Clive Davis's Arista Records and later founded Tastemakers Media. Jay brought his experience in lifestyle and experiential marketing to commercial real estate. His real estate brokerage career flourished as director at Marcus and Milichep and then Eastern Consolidated, representing retailers, restaurants, and office tenants throughout New York. Jay leverages his ability to make connections and utilizes his industry knowledge as he identifies pain points and imagines strategic software solutions. And last but not least, uh, joining us from New Orleans, I believe, although in this virtual world, uh, he could be on a beach for all we know. Uh, Lewis Sterling uh, has been active in real estate acquisition, development, brokerage, and operations for the past 45 years. He founded Sterling and Associates in 1981, a commercial brokerage and property management firm based in New Orleans. They have investments all throughout the Gulf South. He's been involved with the acquisition, development, and management of over 15 million square feet of property. So it would be great to get his perspective from the landlord side. Although he's retired from that company since 2017, he continues to serve on their advisory board. His current activities include leading the Sterling Family Office, Sterling Capital Advisors, and Malbus Plantation Incorporated. He's also a fellow uh, CRE uh, and has served on our executive committee, board of directors, and chaired the finance committee. So thank you, Lewis, for your service there. Okay, so with that, uh, Tom is going to give us uh, a backdrop, some slides that he's prepared with a really fascinating uh, survey that, that the ICM, ICSC membership helped generate. So we're looking forward to, to hearing on that, and then we'll get right into the discussion. Uh, thanks, James, and good, good, day, good day, everyone. It's a real uh, privilege to be with everyone, and it's great to have this opportunity to collaborate uh, with uh, with CRE and and we in fact do have a lot of joint members so it's great to be with uh, with all those members today. I'm going to uh, share uh, a series of information I think will provide some context to our conversation today. Uh, one about kind of the consumer outlook, two around kind of the business outlook, and three uh, just some core facts about the industry. And obviously, retail is an industry that's talked about all the time uh, and is in the in the media and there's a lot of different perceptions and uh, perspectives around where retail is. And so I wanna share a little bit of perspective in regards to what the real facts would say. What, are the, what, what, what is the data underlying uh, the industry I say right now? I do wanna provide just one kind of main topic point, talking point, which is that ICSC is generally optimistic uh, about the future. 
Uh, and particularly as we look to the second half of 2021 and into 2022, you know, there is a significant amount of pent up demand. Uh, we do believe that, that retail is going to perform strongly. Uh, and you've already begun to see that uh, in the early part of this year uh, with pent up demand, with personal savings rates significantly up, with a tremendous amount of capital that's been pushed into the system, particularly in the U.S. economy through U.S. government intervention and involvement. We do feel like there's a strong foundation post-pandemic uh, that retail sales will rebound pretty significantly. So with that, let me, let me first start with just kind of a snapshot of the consumer and what is the consumer uh, saying to us. And so Larissa, if you wouldn't mind turning to the, to the first slide. And ICSC over the course of the pandemic has regularly uh, provided uh, input in regards to consumers outlook. Uh, this is a summary of the 16th survey that we've done since the pandemic began uh, almost about a year ago uh, to this day uh, when closures became uh, pretty commonplace. And uh, generally these, the, the results are telling us a pretty good picture right now. Uh, I would tell you over the course of the last couple of months, particularly as vaccine rollout has accelerated, um, again, particularly in the US, that the outlook has improved significantly. So first, just from a general sentiment standpoint, 35% um, of consumers believe the economy is better than it was a month ago. So when we asked that question previously, and these results are as of last week, 35% uh, believe the economy uh, improved over the course of the last month. The, 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 the majority of the rest, the other 65% believe the economy has remained stable uh, from where it was a month ago. Uh, a clear majority believe the economy will improve in the next 12 months, and a clear majority believe businesses should be open in their state. Um, there's some interesting facts here in regards to um, looking forward. 68% uh, would support uh, if, if uh, the virus was to spike another series of lockdowns uh, in their state. Uh, about 50% are currently engaged in normal uh, out-of-home activity right now. This is a particularly important data point, the next one, and it is something that you'll see um, consistent throughout the slides. 82% expect businesses to maintain health and safety precautions after people are vaccinated. Uh, and almost 50% would increase spending on retail goods and at restaurants if and when they receive stimulus payments. And obviously the stimulus payments are beginning to be deposited in people's accounts today. Uh, what are consumers doing? 36% um, are shopping uh, in a physical store for non-essential goods. Obviously the clear majority of folks are shopping in stores for essential goods. Uh, that number has been growing consistently. And so by shopping, we don't mean just one, you know, one uh, visit. Uh, people are consistently beginning to browse and shop in stores for non-essential goods. About 35% are dining indoors at restaurants and 29% are shopping inside at a mall. And again, uh, post pandemic or post being a person being vaccinated, 85% uh, expect to continue to wear a mask in public places. And what that means was that when they, the question was asked in this, the context of when you are vaccinated, so that's not suggesting that others have been vaccinated yet, but when you are vaccinated, 85% will continue to wear a mask in public places. 85% expect to continue to social distance. 81% will avoid crowded places. And 71% will only get together indoors with people uh, living in the same household. Again, that's not post-pandemic, that's once they've been vaccinated. And, and that's, and I think these data points are, in, are in increasingly important or very important because it suggests that while vaccination will ramp up and we will begin to feel better that the, the behaviors that people have uh, become accustomed to during the pandemic will continue uh, for some period of time. Now, what are businesses saying? If you wouldn't mind turning to the next slide, Larissa. Uh, we did a survey just recently and, and did a, a report that you can find on our on icc.com that talked about outlook uh, for the next really two years from a retail and a consumer and a commercial real estate uh, leaders perspective and i just wanted to share some samplings of some some i thought uh, interesting data points from that report uh, about a third of small retailers implement a click and collect and i would have to say that all of us should be pretty amazed at the performance of small business 
uh, throughout the pandemic and how quickly small businesses adapted. Uh, they have obviously gone through a tremendous amount of disruption. Um, no sector just generally has been more disruptive than small businesses in our industry and in all industries. And I think small business has done a pretty good job uh, despite some pretty significant challenges to adapt. 88% uh, of shopping centers were being used to fulfill online orders, you know, reconfiguring parking lots, et cetera. And then importantly, and nothing speaks to Omnichannel more than the statistic, 99%, so virtually every retailer, uh, fulfilled online orders to some degree in their store. So literally every retailer uh, used their store in some way to fulfill an online order. So Omnichannel and this concept of convergence is really here. And of course, the acceleration of trends that existed pre-pandemic uh, really took hold during the pandemic. And then as you look to outlook and safety, um, nearly six in 10 uh, commercial real estate leaders expect a return to pre-pandemic levels by the end of the year. Pre-pandemic levels being foot traffic within retail centers uh, and 55% of retailers uh, expect to return to pre-pandemic levels by the end of the year. So pretty strong. Uh, and then 80% of small uh, uh, commercial real estate firms are likely to continue the use of plexiglass barriers, et cetera, back to this concept. Again, this is post-pandemic. They expect to have those safety measures uh, continue to be in place. And so both from a consumer standpoint and from a, you know, a business uh, industry leader standpoint, I think you see some pretty consistent trends. One, a fair level of optimism um, and expectation that you know, we will get back to some sense of normalcy from a business activity perspective post pandemic, but a real clear expectation that a lot of the health and safety measures that have been implemented uh, during the pandemic. And I would also say things like curbside pickup and click and collect, et cetera, are going to continue post pandemic for the foreseeable future. Some trends like uh, curbside pickup, I think will be here forever. Um, now I, I wanna switch gears a little bit and just give you some raw data. Um, and, and these are, these are, this is, these are facts that are not meant in one way or another to kind of uh, be positioned positively or negatively. I'm just going to give you the raw facts about the industry as it exists today. So if you would turn to the next slide, Larissa, and this is the composition of retail sales. These are U.S. numbers. And um, on the bottom, what you see, these numbers, by the way, come from the U.S. Census Bureau. They're not ICSC produced numbers. These are the government's numbers, the government's data. And ICC has a very close relationship with the U.S. Census Bureau and works with them to disaggregate information. Uh, but these are official government numbers. And on the bottom, you'll see re the first line being total retail sales as they were reported, including gas uh, and auto. Excludes F&B because restaurant F&B sales are never included in retail sales uh, as reported by the government. And the second line uh, includes auto, but excludes gas. And the third line excludes auto and gas, and of course, F and B. That line, in my mind, is the most relevant line because it really takes out auto and gas, which isn't really specifically relevant to what we're going to talk about today. And then you see the deconstruction of some elements of retail sales and F and B, and, and you can get a sense of the size of them relative to the overall retail sales environment. And I share this with you because there's some pretty important things that were, were happening uh, pre-pandemic and then things that happened during the pandemic. And first and foremost, you can see by that green line, um, I guess it's more of an aqua line, it's not true Irish green on St. Patrick's Day, um, that you saw a pretty significant growth in F&B uh, from 2016 to 2019. And that was a very um, a huge, obviously, uh, trend that was happening in consumer behavior. And as I'll show in a second, a big trend that was happening in shopping centers to react to that consumer behavior. And then, of course, the bottom fell out during the course of the pandemic because of social distancing measures. Um, and then look at the bright red line. Uh, and that's true, pure e-commerce sales. And so these are, this is the number from the U.S. government. And as what you, what you see as a percentage, clearly e-commerce sales were growing at a fairly rapid rate from 2016 to 2019. Still a relatively small number as it relates to overall retail sales. Um, and still even in 2020, a relatively small number 
to overall retail sales, about 11% of line three, but a huge growth, not surprisingly, because of social uh, distancing measures. And then when you look at the, um, you know, the gray line at the top, you can see general merchandise grew a little bit in 2020, and that's where essential retail would fall. And then look at apparel. Um, and you obviously see apparel being relatively flat for the most part from 2016 to 2019, but a huge drop in 2020. And so the point of all this is that while there's a story about retail, when you break it down a little bit into sectors, even at this high a level, you can see kind of the impact of the pandemic. And so it's not a one size fits all. It's not a one story for every subsector within retail um, at all. And then if you turn to the next slide, this gives you a sense of just physical retail, shopping centers, and the distribution of GLA, gross leasable area, and what was it composed of? And as you look back in 2014, you know, almost uh, three quarters of GLA was related to classic retail, 6.9% to food and beverage and 19.5% to non-retail, non-food services. You know, whether it's uh, gyms, healthcare, entertainment, anything that's non-retail, non-food. And then look at 2020 and a huge change. And remember how big this industry is. I mean, we talk about physical retail in every town, every community across uh, the US and Canada and across the world. And as you look at the change in the curation and the mix of GLA over just that relatively short period of time, you see a huge shift away from traditional retail and towards F&B, now at 8.3% in 2020, and towards services, now at 26%. And that was, you know, quite frankly, an industry-wide strategy. That was something that the industry was doing to react to consumer behavior and consumer demand and they were doing it very effectively. Of course, those two at the top of the, of the bar chart there, services, non-retail, non-food, and F&B were the two most significantly hard hit by the pandemic. And so the, the strategy of moving towards food and beverage and moving towards uh, services was well thought out and well being well implemented, but of course was you know, significantly impacted by, you know, the pandemic for obvious reasons. So what does that mean for occupancy, which is something that is obviously talked about all the time, if you go to the next slide, uh, Larissa. And, and so this is, the, this is the picture again of occupancy costs, the, the, the raw facts. And as you look at the industry overall, you can see a drop in occupancy from 93.4% in 2016 to 91.9% in 2020. You know, a, a, a meaningful drop, but certainly not, uh, the bottom is not falling out of the industry. Um, but then if you deconstruct it between open air and malls, you can see that the majority of that drop in occupancy has happened in the mall sector and not all malls clearly. Uh, and we all know the distinction within the marketplace of different types of malls, um, but that is where some of that go back to the conversation about retail sales and apparel and where we saw some of the stresses in the system that is particularly most uh, acute in the mall sector where a lot of those types of retail um, resided. And then finally, if you go um, to the next slide, this just gives you a sense of openings and closings. And we're in the time of the year right now, particularly in the first quarter of, of every calendar year where there's a lot of media around announced uh, openings and closings. And I wanted to give you a picture of what, you know, has happened over the course of the previous five years. And as you can see, you know, back in 2016, basically openings and closings were about the same. Uh, and you started to see that, uh, that gap uh, grow in 2017, close a little bit in 2018, widened significantly in 2019, and then obviously significantly widened in 2020 uh, due to the pandemic. And so there is some stress in the system, but again, go back to where we're seeing stress in retail sales, uh, the drop in retail sales and the sectors that are most challenged within the industry. And then I just thought it'd be interesting to show you kind of the decomposition of the last six months 
um, both in um, from August to January of, an, of announced openings and closings. And it's important to, to, to stress the word announced because announced means announced. It doesn't mean actually effectuated. And so uh, particularly for those uh, closings that are presented here for 2020, that does not necessarily mean that they've actually closed the doors yet. It just means that they plan uh, to, to have some closing. And then finally, if you go to the last slide, another item that's talked about a lot is at this time of the year, particularly in the first quarter, is retail bankruptcies and the related impact upon um, store closures. And obviously you can see um, in 2020 was a particularly challenging year for retail bankruptcies. Again, a lot of that driven by the pandemic. And you can see the impact upon store closures of those bankruptcies. So, so that's a subset of the announced store closures on the previous slide. 70 bankruptcies announced in 2020 that uh, related to about 4,974 announced store closings. You can see pre-2020, the number of bankruptcies were relatively uh, similar uh, year over year. And then if you look at what stores or what retail is being uh, to uh, significantly impacted by those announced bankruptcies and store closings, you can see the decomposition apparel and footwear. Again, back to that, you know, the decomposition of retail sales, that consistent theme, very little impact upon discount department stores, grocery, et cetera. Again, not all retail, the story around retail is not all the same. As, it, as we're in the first quarter of, of, of 2021, uh, bankruptcies in, in January were actually uh, relatively um, as small, uh, in, not just given the environment we're in, but even relative to historical levels um, over the course of the last decade or so. There's only four announced retail bankruptcies um, in, uh, in January 2021. So I shared all that information just to provide some context to today's uh, conversation. I thought it'd be useful and hopefully informative. Um, again, ICSC, and please go to ICSC.com. I know that these slides will be available on CRE's website uh, post the call today, but we have a, a lot of other data and information that you're welcome to get uh, at ICSC.com and access at any time. Uh, but we are, despite some of the challenges in the industry, you know, back to the common uh, theme I, I shared at the start, we are optimistic, you know, that as we migrate out of the pandemic and the vaccinations continue to accelerate, that retail and quite frankly, the overall economy will be relatively robust in the second half of 2021 and into 2022. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was fantastic. Thank you to your organization. Just incredible information to set the stage. And before we talk about, you know, where, where we're going and how to reimagine retail, we have to talk about, you know, where we've been and, um, you know, the, the, a lot of that data and survey uh, is, is real time. So we really appreciate it. And um, for our audience, and we're, we're over 500 strong right now. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, and, and I am looking at the Q&A function. I know we did answer some of those questions during it, but yes, uh, there will be a recording of this presentation that you, you know, uh, so much great content here that uh, we'd be happy if you shared with friends and, and you just heard from Tom that you can go to the ICSC website to get copies of the presentation. Um, Tom, the only other question I saw came in is just how big was this survey? How, how many people participated uh, just so they can get a sense of the, the audience responding. Yeah, it's, a, it's about a thousand people. And again, we've done uh, the, the, the uh, coronavirus consumer survey is a thousand consumers uh, every two to four weeks. And the business leader survey was 400 business leaders, kind of e effectively e evenly distributed between uh, consumer real estate and, um, and retail. Fantastic. No, that's, you definitely gave us the pulse there. So thank you for that. So, you know, and John, I know you had a, bit, a big part in the, the preparation of, of this as, as well, um, being the, the, the chairman of, of ICSC. So um, after hearing that, it definitely seems that many would think the COVID was the demise of many of these retailers. Uh, but for some of these challenge retailers, COVID was actually only accelerated uh, the demise. So uh, again, while we're still trying to figure out what, what happened and then we can get to the, the future, you know, what issues do you think contributed to these pre-COVID struggles? And then, you know, how did COVID ultimately impact the, these struggling group of merchants? 
Well, uh, that's a great question, James. And I think, you know, when you looked at the statistics that Tom put up in terms of the, um, the merchandise categories that suffered the most during the pandemic, it's really no surprise. But these are also merchandise categories that are um, that suffer all the time. And, and the reason I say that is because if you think about apparel and fashion, it's a very fickle industry. Um, and so the success rate over a long period of time is very challenging for, for certain retailers. Uh, so you always have to stay fresh and you always have to stay on top of your game. And, you know, two bad seasons could put you in a lot of financial um, distress. And so, you know, I think the pandemic, like other crises that have happened in the past, exposes certain businesses to their weaknesses, be it a financial crisis, for example. And, and this one was uh, obviously different because um, this was a situation where governments told businesses they had to close. This is what wasn't a lender saying, look, you either, you know, pay your loan or I'm shutting down your business or, or a retailer saying, look, I can't operate anymore because my debt levels are too high. Um, and so, you know, I think this pandemic certainly exposed um, the situation with a lot of retailers. I mean, Tom talked about um, the direction that retailers were going, you know, pre-pandemic. And, you know, it really wasn't anything new because any retailer will tell you that they'll use whatever method possible to get the goods in the hands of the consumer, be it online, be it bricks and mortar, click and collect, delivery, whatever it takes. And a lot of them, the majority of them will tell you, delivery is an essential, but it's not a money maker. It's a money loser. They can't make money at delivering goods uh, to the consumer home. And so, but they have to do it. And so, you know, the pandemic has ex obviously exposed certain businesses uh, in the retail sector um, that were probably weak to begin with. And it just accelerated everything and, and put them in the situation that they're in. Great answer, and uh, you know certainly uh, explains the the rock to all all that great information that we just received. So, um, and, and I want to get to that optimistic place that I know we we all want to go to, but uh, to get there and just kind of dealing with the reality, you know, Lewis, talk about how you've been dealing with with some of your struggling tenants and and how to help them get through this. Um, I, I know in, in our call in advance, we were talking about, you know, sometimes it, it, you want to be helpful, but uh, you can, you know, you're, you're at the, the lenders, um, the lender needs to have involvement as well. So maybe talk a little bit about how you've been navigating these challenging times and how you're helping, you know, tenants get back on their feet. Lewis, you're still on. There we go. I had to, I was on mute, sorry. Um, the key word is flexibility, and and um, you know the the and, and given our portfolio in retail is is predominantly open air centers, we do have a freestanding uh, drugstore and, and and some freestanding uh, I say drug drug stores and and uh, some other some freestanding uh, type of retailers. Um, the the. But to specifically answer your question, flexibility and the biggest challenge has been the um, small small restaurants, neighborhood restaurants, and um, you know they just uh, you know they're usually undercapitalized anyway, and you have to just just work with them, hold their hand, um, try and uh, use your best judgment on who's going to survive this anyway. You know who's who's really operationally is is uh, the kind of tenant that that will survive and and they they of course also play a big part in this the really entrepreneurial uh restaurateurs they you know they they're instantly tables outside chairs outside deliveries you know they make it like really easy for the customer to uh to get keep buying their food so so but flexibility is a key word on that financing um that's a whole I could take up the whole program talking about that. <laughs> we, we, we can definitely, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely circle back on that. And I, I know Jay definitely, you know, he, he's got a new technology platform, or I shouldn't say it, it's that new, but uh, on ways to, to help landlords and, and tenants. And I want to get to that in, in looking forward. But while we still set the stage, 
Deb, you know, you, you do a lot of work in the shopping center space, and many of them were clearly evolving even before this pandemic. So may, maybe a little bit about that evolution, and then, you know, if you then want to help us kind of make the uh, the pivot here and talking about, you know, some of, some of the retailers who have um, repositioned to move forward. Thank you, thank you, um, James. It's true. Uh, similar to retailers, shopping centers themselves have always been evolving. Um, clearly, where we see the demise of some is that they didn't have sufficient vision or capital to get there. Um, capital is key. So those that have evolved have evolved with changing consumer preferences in response to competition and also anchor and specialty tenant closures. So we've seen a lot of effective reuse pre-pandemic. Um, and what were those uses? If you lost an anchor, it was office. And a good example is Fairlane Town Center in Dearborn, Michigan, where Ford took 200,000 square feet. Um, office, um, hospital space, um, Richmond Mall in Mansfield, Ohio, which was replaced a long vacant anchor with Avita Healthcare. And then lifestyle centers. Um, Ceritage has gone around the country and has you know, reused a lot of, of former Sears space, but I think one that was um, particularly ex somewhat exciting was at uh, the collections at UTC, at Westfield UTC in La Jolla. So you had an ugly box that all of a sudden opens up the entire center, but successful, there are many, many, many examples of successful centers that have been evolving and had the capital to do so. I think one great example is Boston Quarter in Arlington, Virginia. It started its life in 1951 as Parkington Shopping Center. It was one of the first major centers in the DC area. It was redeveloped in 1986 as Boston Commons, um, sort of an urban, more fortress-like looking um, structure, but it was well located, it was well visited. And then as people changed, the market changed, um, it was redeveloped again between 2016 and 2018, 19, and it's now called Boston, Boston Quarter. You, they took the second Macy's, which you didn't need, and they made that into a 22-story multifamily project. The specialty space was redesigned with a streetscape approach, and a pedestrian bridge was created to connect all of the office workers and hotel guests that could come across this busy street and go to the center. But there, there are hundreds of centers in this country where that has happened. Um, what happens to those that aren't responding? Well, um, if, if you don't respond, eventually you're gonna be an alternative use. You're not gonna be a shopping center anymore. Um, so we're seeing a lot of creative uses. And, and so one of the things you had asked me to talk about is where are we seeing some um, changes. Well, I think what's important moving forward, and I think that um, Tom mentioned this in his presentation, is that our, the retail world is somewhat circular, that you have to have your feet in all, in all areas. You've got to um, work out things for your consumers so that you are digitally savvy, so that you have a brick, bricks and mortars um, order um, uh, way of showing goods. But what has happened is that we've seen that evolve over time too. And the owners of shopping centers that know that this is, you know, avail themselves of what is going on in those needs, it, it, they're going to be more successful as, as well. So who's expanding? Well, you know, in, 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 in the physical stores, it's, the, you know, it's Starbucks, it's dollar stores, it's discount stores, it's grocery stores, it's automotive, but online retailers, it, it, sometimes it takes them a couple of years to realize that the online experience is not the end all, that you need to have um, an experience that works for um, everyone. And so we've seen a lot of really exciting things that have gone on. The showroom concept, um, concept is, is really, really exciting to me, um, Blue Nile, with jewelry, they have about eight stores right now. They'll have 55 physical showrooms um, in three years. Um, I think also the, the ones like Indochino where you can go in, you make an appointment, in two weeks you can have your suit. 
they they have over 50 locations. Um, ball um, ball and brands, the luxury bedding, they um, they only have three um, showrooms, but they are in 21 Nordstroms. And then and we spoke about this earlier. That's an exciting thing too, because the Nordstrom, you know, if you, you read the press, oh my goodness, you know, are they going to be around in 10 years? But they are also innovative um, in what they are doing. Target is putting um, Ultas and Apples in um, units in their stores. You want to keep, you know, your shopper in there as long as possible. And if you, if you want to go to the physical store, you go to the physical store. If they don't have what you like, you know that you can get it delivered to your home. Um, if you order it and you need it right away, it's beneficial to both the retailer and the customer to be able to do the click and collect. You know, you can, it, it costs less for the retailer and you get your goods um, quicker. So there are, I think that there are a lot of innovative things going on, but I think the key to shopping centers and retailer success is innovation. It's reimagining it's seeing the future and, and, and keeping your finger on the pulse of the consumer. Could not agree more. I'm glad we picked the right name for the, the topic of this presentation today, but yeah, you, you gotta evolve. And um, Jay, I know that that's what you, you've been doing your whole career. So, you know, maybe tell the audience a little bit about your, your technology platform yeah. that's allowing landlords and tenants to come together and launch some of these new tenants and get them on their feet during this challenging time. And then maybe the same question I asked Deb is, you know, what are some of the bright spots? What are some of the tenants who are taking this opportunity to grow? Okay, that's great. No, thanks. And I wanna thank everybody for having, having us here. Um, as James mentioned earlier, my name is Jay Norris. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Guest Platform. What is Guest and who is Guest? Guest is a team of retailers, property owners, hospitality experts and technologists. And what our overarching mission is, is to foster trust and transparency amongst property owners and their tenants for the ultimate goal of helping all businesses thrive. And that's what our vision is, guys. And, you know, let me tell you what we have built. And I'm talking about innovation here. What we've built is a third party verification platform that provides um, a property owner with a view of their tenants daily sales performance all on one unified dashboard see it uh, I guess we believe that the commercial real estate ecosystem is comprised of a lender as you guys mentioned earlier uh, Lewis didn't want to talk about it lender landlords and their tenants but you know we are all driven by consumer spending habits, as Tom mentioned earlier in his presentation. And so what our team has decided to do was to build a performance analytics tool so that all the players can benefit and make qualified decisions moving forward with utilizing um, pragmatic and real-time sales data that we provide. Now, um, to answer your question, um, there's numerous ways these are happening. You've been hearing about pop-ups. They're happening all over the place. Um, as, as Deborah mentioned, they're, they're happening everywhere. But now we see an influx of like digitally native brands who have, who have never tested brick and mortar, seeing this is an opportunity to dive into the market right now. We're seeing that a lot. Um, you know, here, here in New York and all centers all over the country, they're creating new specialty leasing divisions, um, incubator labs, and you're seeing all these kind of these test um, environments going on. But also we're seeing that, you know, you can utilize our platform to test and then land on um, a fixed rent deal after that. So a lot of, a lot of property owners want to use our platform for that. And if, so they can get that transparency up front and a short term and then figure out how to move forward. That's fantastic. And I, I had the chance to demo the, your, your latest technology. And it, it, it's amazing where both landlords and tenants can see the performance by day and you can structure a lease around it to try to get them to the point where they want to lock in. Right. And, you know, for the tenants also to know, hey, I got 10 locations, what, what are the best performers and, and how do we, we grow on that? So re really exciting to see on that.
Yeah, no, we're um, excited about that. So, so Tom, you know, just, just again, thinking about moving forward and how we do this. I mean, I, I will say that the one thing about your survey that was a little troubling to me when you've got over 80% of the people saying that they, you know, even with a vaccine, they don't want to come back into large groups. And for me, and, and maybe I'm just being a little, you know, Pollyanna thinking, you know, once the vaccines are out, everything goes back to normal. But, you know, I, I'm thinking about how, how we're going to go do what we do, you know, at, the, at your convention in Vegas. I mean, the whole point is being out there with tons of people running into people, you know, not just at the, the convention center, but at the events, the parties, you know, going to hear great speakers that you put it, put on. So how are we going to do that if the majority of people are saying, look, we don't feel comfortable even post vaccine gathering in mass and, and you know, thinking about how these venues are going to accommodate accommodate large numbers of people. You know, I, it, it's a great question. I, I actually was quite surprised by that, um, those results as well. But I think if you, you know, if you ask the question in somewhat of a vacuum, you know, you're vaccinated and you're not confident yet that, you know, a large number of other people are vaccinated, you might answer it that way. Um, you know, quite frankly, there's also still restrictions in place in the way people, you know, can behave, et cetera. You know, I, I kind of, I'm very, and maybe I, I don't want to be Pollyannish, but I'm fairly optimistic that once we get to, you know, a, a high percentage of people vaccinated, that we're social beings and we're going to want to be back uh, and interact socially. And I just look at the behaviors of people when they've been given a taste of, you know, some relaxation and restrictions and social distancing, you know, at very, any, anywhere in the world, quite frankly, you've seen people flock to get back out shopping and going to restaurants and so forth. So I, I, I'm fairly um, confident that that will return. But I do think, I, I do think some of the aspects, which are probably good things, quite frankly, you know, the, the, you know, the visible and uh, nature of, of sanitation and sanitation stations and hand wipes and, and, you know, some level of queuing up and so forth is probably a smart thing. And I don't think that, I don't think some of those less obtrusive things will go away. Um, Cause it's been a year and it's been a dramatic year. I mean, this isn't just a year, any old normal year. I mean, we've been, the what we've gone through as a society, as a global society, and I think this is all over the world, um, is, is not something that's gonna go away easy. That those, those, um, habits are not going to go away easy. But I think the broad sense of people still wanting to get together and congregate and so forth, you know, is, is, uh, is ever present. And I'm, and I can, I'm a fat, you can tell by the presentation, I'm very much a fact-based kind of guy and a data kind of guy. And I also, when I look at the long-term things, when you look at demographics and things of that nature, you know, millennial, growing millennials, beginning to raise families, you know, buying homes, those types of things that drives consumer demand more than anything else. You know, when you buy a home, you get married, buy a home and have a kid that you end up buying a lot of stuff. And you're starting to see the millennials do that in, in droves and, and quite frankly, suburban living and those types of things have really become valued uh, throughout the pandemic. So I think all of that will contribute to, you know, uh, quite frankly, positively contribute to retail going forward as well. Once we get past, you know, a, you know, obviously a pretty dramatic period of time in global history. Uh, Thank you. I, I really like that, that answer. And uh, I think what would be interesting, I mean, and again, the fact that you've been doing this survey throughout, you know, to check and, and see, you know, how that comfort level, you know, really shows in the numbers as we, we move towards herd immunity. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm hoping for that portion of the response. It's just <laughs> a snapshot at this moment in time. So, you know, John, the other thing is, it, you know, uh, local jurisdictions, well, really, you know, governmental jurisdictions, um, and, and it's great that we have another international panel with us today and thinking about what's going on in Canada versus the U.S., but, you know, here it's a very state-by-state. State. And I was talking to a friend this week who was down in Florida, supposedly going to a socially distance, you know, conference. And then he shows up and everyone's in a packed room with no masks. And it's just, you know, it's, <laughs> you're going to see different things happening. But, but how does, you know, um, 
I don't think it's it's safe to assume or fair to say that everything's going to kind of roll out the same way, state by state, country by country. So, so how much does governmental intervention play into this recovery? Well, James, I think it plays a lot. I mean, obviously, um, you know, it was the World Health Organization about a year ago that said that declared a, a global pandemic, and none of us have been alive since there has been a global pan pandemic before. So. Um, this is this was something really new, and and as a result, uh, at both the federal level, the state level, the provincial level, level wherever you are, the government stepped in right away and said, okay, then we need to lock down everything. And um, you know, it's interesting your question because I've I've seen the stories or read the stories about different parts of the United States, Florida, for example. I guess it's spring break down there right now, and you know. Uh, younger people are having fun, not wearing masks. Uh, the last time I checked, the pandemic has not been declared to be over. Um, so um, we still are in a pandemic. Um, people are still getting COVID. People are still dying from COVID. Yes, people are getting vaccinated, but we're not there yet. So um, I think I share Tom's optimism that, um, you know, we are going in the right direction. Um, we're really hopeful that we can hold um, our recon conference in December. Um, and we're hoping that people that, that come are obviously um, vaccinated and or are prepared to protect themselves. But the governments um, obviously have had a lot to say about who can do business and who can't. And, and, and so, um, you know, you look at Canada and the United States, I mean, the border shut down. It's been shut down for a year. Um, so you can fly back and forth, but you've got to quarantine yourself if you come back to Canada for 14 days and you've got to stay in a hotel for three days. A lot of people don't want to do that. Um, so, you know, until they start to, and the, me the messaging keeps getting to be mixed. Um, it's very inconsistent and I think it's confusing people uh, beyond belief and until they get their act together. And I, and I understand where they're coming from because the information that is coming out from uh, the medical experts that are doing all the testing and what have you. I mean, there's just this recent uh, dialogue with the AstraZeneca vaccine. People are confused about blood clots or no blood clots. Should sure. we, should I take it or not take it? Um, so, um, you know, there's a lot's going to have to happen um, before things um, stabilize. You know, Hey James. I'll... Great points. Sure. Jay, you want to weigh in? Yeah. You know, I was just going to weigh in. And just listening to what you just said, John, I was thinking about how what we have to do is, is not be reactive. And another reason why I like the, the analytics that Tom presented earlier, the data, is it's going to help us figure out exactly how to move forward, right? And that's why we like to call it performance analytics. Um, you know, I envision, we envision, I guess, the world, and I was telling this to Lewis uh, the other day, that, uh, and Michelle, and that you, as you're checking your, you know, your, your stock portfolio, every day we're, we're watching it, right? I feel as though I can see and envision in a world where property owners are looking at their tenant and their portfolio and their performance on a daily, on a daily basis. And so essentially, just so that we can make the right proactive decisions instead of waiting and being reactive 30, 60, 90 days later, if you have the right performance analytics tools, I think we'll be making, you know, more qualified decisions moving forward. And that's all driven off of what, what you just said, consumers' habits, right? Great point. Yeah, no, I, I really like that and to, to, you know, leverage the data, mm -hmm. data-driven decisions. Yep. So, Lewis, with everything going on, there's no doubt been, you know, disruption, but disruption also creates opportunity and kind of thinking about the new world of retail you know, are you still a buyer? And if so, what would you be looking to redevelop or build today? Uh, well, I don't think we'd be looking to build anything today unless it was um, pre-leased um, from a retail perspective. We are uh, building medical um, buildings. We, you know, we, we have a our portfolio you know, historically when we, when we started the business, it was probably 99% retail. And over the years, and I've, you know, we've, we've migrated to probably about 50% retail. And then we have off, you know, pretty much every other kind of category. And, and 
where we where we are redeveloping and retenanting our portfolio is a lot of uh, non-traditional retail where you know clinics or or other type of service um, you know users. So I wouldn't I wouldn't we you know when times turn like they are today, it's like we we kind of drill down and refocus on the existing portfolio and make sure that we do everything that is possible to keep it as healthy as possible. And, and, um, and so that's, that's where we are on that. We, you know, we, we're, we're sort of divided up into two categories, such as uh, this presentation. One is, all right, what's the future going to look like? Where are we going? And what do we need to do to stabilize, uh, keep, keep the, uh, the, and we're pretty lucky in that, in that, I think 90, you know, we're back to 95% of what our revenue was, you know, as far as rental income was prior, you know, pre, pre uh, COVID. And, uh, but, and we, and we had a good balance of loan to value. Our portfolio was probably about 55% uh, debt. And so we, and we had a lot of cash reserves. So we, we were in a good spot for something bad to happen versus other people. Um, we didn't have very many CMBS loans. We have a few, um, which to me, that's, that's, uh, that's not really user friendly for stress in the marketplace. CMBS is not the way to, to go. So, but, but what, so, so from what are we doing today, fighting the fight of the, of the pandemic, which is to me, we, we got a, a as everyone said, a, a, we, we, it's not over yet. It's not been declared over. And I think this fight is um, is going to be going on from a property perspective at least another year, um, to, because there's still no clarity. Um, I mean, we had, you know, we have Belk in our in our portfolio. We had J.C. Penney in our portfolio. They both are bankrupt. I think Belk was bankrupt for two days, you know, and and um, and I don't remember how long, uh, but they're both out of bankruptcy. And and. But as far as the financial institutions are, are concerned, they're they're still bankrupt. You know, they put them on a, the watch list or the, the 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 big red X for at least twelve more months. So when you go to refinance a property, even though they're out of bankruptcy, it, it they're treated as if they're in bankruptcy. So so there's all sorts of complexities in the daily fight. Now, where's the future? I think the future, and we've all touched on it. Um, we have to be prepared for smaller boxes. You know, I think tenants are. Um, or they're looking for flexibility now because they don't have the answer. They just know that they got to change what they're doing. So, so we know we have to be flexible. So what, what, what I think, I think parking lots are going to look different. I think you got to have, have to have more reserve spaces for pickup. You know, those aren't going to go away. I think smaller boxes, uh, uh, just, you know, we were moving that way prior to COVID. I mean, we've touched on that too. There, there's, there's this whole COVID thing has, has mm -hmm. accelerated a lot of the changes in the real estate industry. You know, we had already started, uh, I think we have some Tesla charging stations in some of our parking lots that, you know, we had like 10 spaces, boom, they're all set up. Well, I think, you know, that was moving that way anyway. I think, the 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 whole dynamic of how you use parking lots, uh, and, and it and the whole functionality is just going to be completely different. Tenant mix is going to be different, and when you start playing with all those things, then all of a sudden you start playing with lease provisions, and what do uh, you know co tenancy clauses look like? What do I mean? It gets it starts hitting on loan documents, lease documents. Uh, and and God help you when you have to deal with zoning and planning because they're usually way behind as far as because tenants and, and landlords have to be really nimble and quick and reactionary to to what consumers are doing and consumer consumers are fickle uh, as the uh, discussion on apparel was a few minutes ago so uh, again that's a, a lot in what I just said and uh, and you can drill down on probably a hundred of those little tidbits but uh, so I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I, I, I got to thank it, especially with all our Canadian friends on the line. I mean, I, I'm thinking of the Wayne Gretzky, you know, skate where the puck is going. I mean, that's really what you're talking about is thinking, you know, where are we headed and how do I deliver that and get ahead of it? So, um, flexibility and innovation. That's right. Flexibility and innovation is where it's going to land. 
No doubt. So we're, we're um, and thank you for everyone so far who's been adding questions and, and we're getting loaded up. And so I'm going to get to those questions, you know, I, I, uh, just right after this. Uh, so so we'll, we'll have some time for discussion. But um, before we do that, um, Deb, where does logistics play into all this? And, you know, I, I think it was our office in Toronto. They, they were telling me that maybe it was a mall that came down and Walmart took the whole thing for a massive distribution center. And so, you know, they've got their sites on Amazon and it, is it just going to be Amazon versus Walmart? You know, who are the other big players getting into this? You know, how, how do you look at logistics, um, uh, basically you know, delivering in, 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 in comparison to uh, bricks and mortar? I, well, I think that it's a factor of life and, and we are, we're seeing the Walmarts and the Amazon take space like this is that often at sites that were less successful as shopping centers. So we've seen, a, you know, a couple of situations like that. Um, I, it's just being innovative. If you can, if you have a distribution facility that's closer to what you're distributing to, you're going to save money, you're going to be able to provide more to your shopper base. So I think that it's it's just all in, in, in general, we're all saying the same things because we, we need we need an effective way to get the goods to the shopper and we need to do it in a way that's quick and at minimal cost um, for you know the entity that's shipping those goods. So, you know, I think we're going to see that. And it's interesting, one of the questions someone had asked was also about, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting out a question for myself, but um, direct to consumer shopping. It was interesting because Wayfair pre-pandemic wasn't showing any profit at all. And then the pandemic hit, and we don't hear those stories, but the pandemic hit and they're doing much better. Chewy's doing much better. So. You know, there are some things that came out of the pandemic that we can. Deborah? To our oh. shopper base at a cost that's reasonable. Perfect. Does anyone want to speak to the logistics piece on this before we um, we start looking at some of the questions that the audience has asked? Uh, James, sorry, James, it's John. I just want to make a point, um, and, and Tom, maybe you can weigh in as well. One of the things that we've been hearing from a lot of our retail members is um, that, you know, in a lot of retail uh, companies, especially the large, whether it's a large department store or a large chain store with, with many, many locations, um, you know, and, and I'm going to try to say this in the right way, the, the, re the real estate people and retail companies don't always get the respect they deserve. They're a little bit like a Rodney Dangerfield. And, <laughs> um, and one of the things that we've heard loud and clear is that the operating people in these re retail companies have now recognized the importance of location and the importance of place. And the reason we're hearing that is because of the pandemic because of um, the fact that they can't utilize, they can't utilize their stores the way they were obviously intended, that they're now recognizing the importance of the location in terms of it also acting as a distribution center, if you know what I mean. In other words, it's click and collect or it's delivery. It's, it's become uh, in the short term, a depot, if you will. And, and the operating people uh, have said to the real estate people, we didn't realize that this was a, a function that this space was going to have for us. And thank God we have it. And thank God it's in these locations because if we didn't, we'd be in trouble. And so I think that's an important point uh, that needs to come out of all the discussions around bricks and mortar real estate. It's not just to serve a purpose um, during uh, normal business times. It's obviously serving a purpose during a, a worldwide pandemic. To, to add to what you just said, John, I we totally agree. It's um, it's an omni-channel world we're living in, right? All the omni-channel, and essentially, even to your point, even the food businesses, right? Like they were shut down in, in store, but their online business, you know, the third-party delivery apps, was what kept them afloat. Well, you know, and so it's the same: buy online, pick up in store, for 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 you know, dry-use retailers as well as for F and B. So they have all had to, like we said, this whole conversation is about 
how uh, businesses pivoted, but really what they were doing was being innovative and flexible. All right. Agreed. So well, that's I'll, yeah, I'll jump in there. And, uh, well, well uh, go ahead. I'll let you. No, go. I was I was just going to say. I mean, it, back to to the surveys. Remember the, you know, I said the ninety nine percent of retailers said they were using their stores to fulfill online orders uh, during the course of the pandemic, and and I think you know that's being driven by a lot of factors. Obviously the pandemic accelerated a trend that, you know, was taking place before that, but let's not forget that, you know, e-commerce is not a particularly profitable business. Um, you know, the last, fulfilling the last mile um, is quite challenging if I'm shipping it directly to the consumer. Um, but if I, if the consumer is absorbing the distribution costs by coming to my store, that turns that you know transaction into potentially it's clearly a much more profitable transaction. So it's in the retailer's best interest, you know, to utilize their store to fulfill their orders. And those retailers that have ha had a you know a strong physical footprint, you know, throughout the pandemic, you know, really leaned into that. And when you look at kind of the you know the quarterly re re results that were reported over the over really just all, even the last quarter, you know, you looked at Walmart and Target and others. I mean, obviously they knocked it out of the park. Yes, they're essential retailers, but look at the decomposition of their results and how much of their sales, right. you know, were fulfilled out of the store, even their e-commerce sales that were fulfilled out of the store. And so I think you're going to see stores really become, you know, fulfillment epicenters, uh, as well as a place to engage with your customer. They're really becoming fulfillment epicenters, and that doesn't mean they're going to become a distribution center. They're just gonna they're going to serve multi purposes, and and the pandemic brought that nothing yeah. in the last twenty yeah. years made that more obvious than the pandemic. So, you know, it, it's funny. I, I we had um we had some uh, clients uh, speaking about the uh, saying that you know certain assets were um, kind of declining on the way into the pandemic. And now it's like, you know, it's been a catalyst. The pandemic was like inevitable. I mean, what was happening with these businesses was in inevitable. It's just the pandemic was a catalyst to getting there. And so mm -hmm. we've had to pivot and move much faster on their innovation. But I do agree with what you said, Tom, you're right. They're gonna become these epicenters where they'll have buy online, pick up in store, fulfillment, um, but they still have to have the right store experience. You know, and I think that, that a lot of businesses who really master the user experience and that efficiency on the, the clicks business is, are the ones that are going to prevail. Mm -hmm. I wanted to 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 uh, jump in here about the just the e-commerce uh, prior to the pandemic disruption, which we we were watching the clicks and and bricks um, as it evolved and. And every year, you know, e-commerce was growing and growing and growing and growing, and it was eroding, uh, you know, traditional retail sales. But in our mind, it was it was never going to shift 100. percent You know, it, you would always, but we didn't know where it would be. Where it would end, would it end up being at 10 percent of the retail, or 15, or 25, or 50, 50? We didn't know. This pandemic basically accelerated everything to where it was. At some point during it, it was up, it was a hundred percent. And then it became, then it started starting to creep back. And then, but so, so it, the good news is we, 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 the good news from a, where does e-commerce end up is by having everybody have to figure out how to deliver their particular goods to the consumer, they're finding the, the, the problems. And I'll, uh, again, I'll contend that it's probably, uh, you know, uh, It'd be a wild guess if I said, well, I think it's going to end settling up in 25, 75 as far as retail, you know, how much is e commerce versus bricks. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not going to put the bricks out of business. It's going to, it's going to change the function of the bricks, how many stores uh, retailers have, and size and shapes and, and, and lots of other delivery issues. And one of the things that we've found is that certain things just don't deliver. For instance, you can deliver pizza and you can deliver chicken wings, but you can't deliver a really good steak. It doesn't deliver well. Yeah. And 
and if you, it it just doesn't show and french fries don't show up well i mean it's just there's certain things that that just don't deliver and, and let now technologically maybe somebody will come up with a way to have a, a you know a rare steak delivered and it still tastes like when they bring it to your table but it doesn't happen today and right. and uh, i mean my my the specific instance my wife orders basically raw hamburgers because she's got to stick it in the microwave and she doesn't want it overcooked when it gets to the house well it still doesn't taste as good because it's anyway the point is people are finding out not everything delivers and that's and 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 unless they scientifically come up with a way or a contraption or which people you know we're inventive and creative and you know somebody will figure it out maybe but um plus socially um i think we touched on that i mean uh you know i always you know, ask my wife shopping questions because she's the shopper. And, and, and um, it's like, she's not going to say, Hey, God, I'll, you know, all her friends come over and sit around the desk and look at a computer and go shopping and have lunch at the house. It's not happening. They're going to go out and they're going to have lunch and they're going to have a, you know, it's just like guys go play golf, they go do what they do. And so it, it's a social, we're social beings and we have to have a place to go be social. So anyway, so well said. Uh, although your point of delivering the food, I'm thinking of those autonomous uh, vehicles that I've been thinking about that, that have the, you know, the, the grill on, on board or, or uh, <laughs> on site. So I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll figure it out or no, have drones deliver. But I, I, I do want to take a step back because we got to start getting through some of these questions because we're, we're almost at uh, 2.15. We got 15, 20 minutes left. Mm -hmm. This is a big one, and we have a lot of comments coming in on this wavelength and maybe part of the reason why, you know, those 80% numbers of people having concerns and, um, you know, maybe we need Dr. Fauci on, on, on the webinar <laughs> for this one. But, the, you know, the, the point is that there is uh, a fear of different mutations of the strain. And, and one of the comments even said, hey, guys, you're talking about the future and the vaccine. Like we're we're still in the eye of the storm on this thing. So you know how how do we you know how do we reconcile all of this? And you know I, again, I, it's like planning for the future. I mean, all we can do right now is look at the data, what we have, you know, what's going on with the vaccine rollout. But like you know, I don't know, a new strain shows up. I mean, what do, what do we do with that? You know, are, are we going to be better prepared next go around? I mean, I, I think part of your survey said that maybe the screens, you know, would still remain in the restaurants. But, you know, how do we how do we deal with the unknown? Wow. Well, I want to take a stab at that, Tom. Sure, you go ahead. If you could, if you want to answer the unknown, you go for it. <laughs> you know, like... Like my thing is, they did say he was a futurist no in his, uh, his bio. About, there's no crystal ball, right? All we can do is 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 really lean back on the data we have now. Like you said, we're not Fauci, right? And we're you know we're tuning in and making sure that we trust the data that we're receiving, and just make those kind of qualified decisions moving forward. But we don't have a crystal ball. But business is still going on. I just want to you know let's. Let's just land there. Let's not that business has ceased. Business is going on and certain businesses are, are flourishing. And I feel as though the ones that are flourishing are the ones that have been innovative and they have really looked at the consumer as the real brand and said, I'm going to meet you wherever you want to be. Wherever you want is where I'm going to end up at that channel. And they're meeting them there. And so I feel as though, you know, no matter what, well, I mean, as long as we're still breathing, right? And <laughs> we all get vaccinated. Um, I think that, you know, we'll be better prepared if this, ha if, if, if this event happens again in the future. Hopefully, if we we're willing, it won't. But no, hopefully it won't. I, 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 would, I would agree. I think we're better prepared if, if you know, if this uh, accelerates. But I think the, I think the concern is a, is a real one, um, you know, and, and legitimate. Because the one thing we've learned over the course of the last year is to, that there's going to be lots of twists and turns along the way, and we don't exactly know what the, you know, next month's going to, going to hold out. You know, my. And that would be by, you know, my biggest concern is the premise of the question, which is, I think if, if the vaccine, we continue down what, what the path we're on right now, and it looks like the vaccines are, 
going to get uh, distributed and accelerated and we're going to reach some level of mass vaccination at some point, you know, in 2021, you know, then I think we have, we have a legitimate position to be fairly optimistic. If something happens along that journey that changes that course, then I think, yeah, I think there's a lot that could, you know, that could, uh, that could trip us up. And I, and my biggest concern would not be in that environment, quite frankly, would not from a business perspective, wouldn't be the largest businesses. It would be the stress on the small business community. And, and the small business community has gone through so much over the course of the last year. And, and I think, uh, you know, the level of innovation and entrepreneurship has been remarkable. Um, but it takes capital um, at some point. And if, if, if this was to, if the path was to change and the variants were to stick and so forth, then I, I, I worry about the impact on small business, which is a huge part of, you know, economies around the world. But I choose to be optimistic that the vaccines will, you know, will, will hold. But I think you got to be prepared for the unexpected because that's what we've learned. Yeah. I, I see Michelle's jo joining us uh, uh, now, and I, I, you're welcome if you have any thoughts on the topic. I mean, one other variation of this question is asking about, you know, how do builders plan for the, the future? Are there going to be, you know, governmental regulations, code regulations? So, you know, again, on the topic of kind of planning uh, for, for the unknown. So, I know Deb, you work with a lot of developers too, so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really what we've learned is prepare for the unexpected. It's prepare, uh, you know, clearly there's not a, a complete, it's not the, the road forward, there's a lot of unknowns associated with it, but everyone that we, that I know is just focusing, learning from what, what has happened, focus, hopefully you have enough capital to keep up with the times and, um, you know, for shopping centers, it's basically, it's um, keeping the, the center fresh and whether, and, 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 and whether it's both physical and it's with tenancy and it's with concept. So the mm -hmm. concepts will change. Maybe um, people, maybe it will take a while to get people into the centers themselves, but people value experience. They do value experience. And if you bring that experience and offer that experience up, um, they're gonna they're gonna come because people are tired. They're tired of sitting, and and there'll always be some people that will click and order, and you know don't need to go to the store. But many people do. Many people do. To to add to that, um, great success endeavor. I was hoping I get my shot tomorrow. I don't know about everybody else, but I know that um, I'm looking forward to actually getting back out there. A little cabin fever now. We've been over a year. And the experiences, Lewis mentioned a good steak at a restaurant, you know, all these things that we know that it's like pent up, right, demand. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. That is the crystal ball that I'm looking at, <laughs> we're looking at. And I understand the question, um, but I definitely know that if we lean on science like we have and we keep moving, that uh, we'll figure it out. I'm, I'm hoping that th Tom, I too understand the small businesses. I work with them intimately and I totally get it. And that's why, you know, we built our platform to really help these businesses, you know, uncover solutions for them to succeed um, in a good time and in a, and in a tumultuous time. So that's, uh, but the experiences, Deborah, hands down, people are, are dying for them right now. Everybody is, is longing for those experiences. And so if they're safe, I think, uh, I think, well, I think, well, I'm optimistic. I hope you guys are as well. Wonderful. Hey, James, I, I, yeah. have a, I have a question for, for John or Tom. Um, yes. What is, uh, what is the, uh, the outlet segment doing right now? Are they, how are they handling things? Uh, they, they must be uh, having their difficulty as well. Could you uh, have a, few thoughts on that? Even Simon, Tanger? Yeah. Um, well, they're, you know, I mean, I think they're finding the same challenges as everybody else um, in terms of, um, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, you're in various jurisdictions, you're only, whether you're allowed to open or not, 
Uh, and then if you are, if the stores are allowed to open, if you're allowed to have customers on the property, how many people are allowed in, in each store? Um, so the restrictions around that. So it's, it's been a slow comeback. Um, consider it to be, um, you know, unenclosed retail. So it's different than the mall situation, obviously, but, and the types of tenants that are, that are in these outlet centers, um, are more value in nature, discount in nature, as you know. And, uh, you know, I think we're, what we're hearing is that the consumer wants to come back and be in the store and, you know, do the typical consumer things. They want to look at the merchandise. They want to be able to try on the merchandise. Um, but they're also using the store sometimes as um, a place to bring back merchandise. Uh, so there's a convenience factor to them. Um, but they're not an outlier in any way, if that's, if that's what you're, uh, you're wondering, Michelle. Because mm. a lot of the manufacturers, suppliers are are bypassing traditional retailers, obviously, and reaching out to consumers. Uh, they've done it through obviously uh, the e-commerce uh, tendency and and trends. Is this something that uh, that's going to continue in the sense that it, it, it become even more uh, dominant from from manufacturers and suppliers directly? Well, it's an interesting question because when outlet centers first um, you know, came about in the United States, they were actually true manufacturers outlet centers. Those stores were actually operated by brand manufacturers. And then over time, um, they became more mainstream. So you had regular type retailers opening off um, outlet stores. And what they were doing is they were having um, um, either selling seconds or sale items, or they're having merchandise specifically manufactured for those stores of a lesser quality. And so it became an aspirational store for, for consumers. For example, if they couldn't afford to shop in a polo store, in a mainline polo store, they could go to an outlet polo store and buy the logoed product, if you will, but pay a lower price, but get a more inferior quality product. Uh, product because that's the way it was manufactured. So, um, you know, and then the manufacturers um, need to be careful because they they do have clients uh, who are retailers that sell their goods and services. So they've got to be careful in terms of um, um, overlapping uh, and opening stores that compete with their retail clients. So, you know, it, it, it certainly depends on the manufacturer and the product, um, but it definitely has shifted away from from a true manufacturer's outlet store to more of a, a discount retail store. Hmm. Thank you, Tom. Uh, John, I mean, in no terms of percentage, uh, maybe Tom, in your, your uh, survey, you, you've gone through that, but in terms of percentage of apparel, uh, do you have an idea what is the percentage being on the online from the apparel uh, products? You know, I don't have it, uh, you know, on the tip of my tongue, I, but it's certainly an increasing percentage uh, yeah. for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's no doubt. I mean, that's part of obviously what's driving, um, you know, the decrease in, in apparel, you know, sale, right. in sales that a lot of that's going e-commerce and obviously Apple, I'm sorry, Amazon moving into the apparel uh, industry is, has, you know, had an impact on it as well. I mean, part, partly, quite frankly, also just remember part of the shrieking apparel numbers is that there's just, there was there might have just been too many, too much you yeah. know, competition in apparel. I mean, it was just, everybody was opening up apparel and there was just too much. And so there was a consolidation in that part of the industry as well. So I think it's a combination of factors. I wouldn't look at the decrease in apparel sales and say that's a direct correlation to online growth. Some of it's just a needed uh, contraction and rationalization of how much was out in the marketplace to begin with. But in fair, there is an increasing amount online. I, I just don't know the exact percentage of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely. To add to that, Michelle, um, we definitely, I know, I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say a lot of the future on this, you know, the bricks, bricks to clicks will happen from the clicks business, you know, um, meaning a lot of the digitally native brands, the ones that have grown, they yeah. recognize that they have to take a brick and mortar location. Right. And they also see the bricks, the clicks effects. So we 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 definitely know that you will see a lot more of uh, the digitally native brands taking uh, physical locations, um, especially because of the opportunity right now, the opportunity cost for them. And they also know 
be very clear. They know the data. They know exactly where their consumers live. You know, they know exactly where they live because of the online sales. So they could create a roadmap and a strategy, essentially nationally, on where they need to be without getting any advice. Jay, do you, have a, do you have an idea of, of um, what are the rates uh, of the tenant providing uh, retail sales to their landlord? What are the rates? Yeah. What, what is the... Oh, I, I can't say that. All I do know is that 100% of all sales that are reported to the property owner come from the tenant. That's all. You know what I mean? Like meaning the, the, the tenant is the one providing sure. the property owner for 30 days or a year later. And so that's why we created our platform as a third party okay. verification, you know, and, that, and, and, and that deal could be, doesn't have to be a percentage rent deal. It could be any rent concession or any type of deal. We just feel as though we need to create this trust and transparency so that everybody's living in the real world on what's happening on the ground or on online channels or whatever channel that is, but we have that data. And like I said, I'll bring it back that data, that's the consumer spending habits mm -hmm. and where mm -hmm. they're spending, mm -hmm. where they're spending. So then that way, these small business or what we talked about earlier, they can be more proactive and be more flexible and dynamic because they have the right data to substantiate that move. You know? Um, okay. Yeah. So Michelle, I, I know. Uh, I mean, this has been fantastic. I, I know we're we're coming up to uh, two thirty for our, our end time, and uh, I, I just I'm so grateful to our panel here. You, you all have just been fantastic. I mean, this has been an amazing discussion, and you know, it, it's certainly been a, a challenging past year, but uh, th this certainly has made me feel a lot more optimistic for the for the future. So. Um, again, as I said from the beginning, I, I hope I'm going to be seeing you all very soon um, in one of these upcoming conventions, uh, and uh, I have no doubt that we'll, we'll get there soon. So, Michelle, do you want to take us out with any last thoughts? Uh, well, again, I, I, I concur, obviously, and I echo, and this has been a great, great session, uh, and I'd like to thank you, uh, uh, James, to, to, for you quality of moderation here to moderate this uh, this this session. I'd like to thank so much uh, our panelists and our speakers, Deborah, Tom, John, Jay, Lewis. Uh, there's no question that retail is always evolving and, and we need to evolve with it. Uh, by the way, on-demand recordings are available for most uh, What's Next session, including today's. And uh, I encourage everyone to visit cre.org slash webinars for information on other topics and thought-provoking programs in development, including the special presentation of partnership with the American Hotel and Lodging Association in May on May 20th. Until then, and on behalf of the counselors of real estate, thank you for attending What's Next for Real Estate and Life Experience. Thanks for having us. Thank Have you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you again. Have thank a great you. day.